I am here today to talk to you about something that I have been trying to figure out for a long time. I'm a content strategist. I'm currently the director of content strategy at MadPow. I'm pretty new there. It's very exciting. Wonderful group of UXers. Here's the question. What does a content strategist do? I've been trying to figure this out for ages. And I think I've finally come up with a good answer. I'm pretty sure that as a content strategist, my job is to help out the UX practitioners. That's an answer everybody wants to hear, right? My job is to make your job easier. Let's, let's think about this for a minute. First, a question for all of you, and just shout out some answers. Whose job is it to make sure that things are useful, usable, valuable, desirable, all of these things, accessible, findable, credible, whose job is that? Who does that? Everyone. Everyone? I like that answer. What job title might you call it? What, what field is it? I'll give you a hint. Think of the title of this conference. <laughs> UX, right? All right, now I'm going to phrase that a slightly different way. Whose job is it to make sure that the content on those products is usable? useful, findable, desirable, valuable, credible. Whose job is that? <laughs> Content strategist. We've got sort of the same goal in mind. We want things to be user friendly. We want things to keep the user in the center. We want things to be user centric. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the content strategist is the puppy to the UX child. Think about it. It makes sense. It makes sense. Go with me here. Children, not every child has a puppy dog, but once they get one, they cannot imagine life without it. It makes their life so much better. Equally, not every UX practitioner gets to work with a content strategist. But once you do, they're pretty awesome. And if you're sitting there thinking, uh, I don't know about that, okay, well, I'm sorry that you hate puppies. So the thing is, though, puppies and kids, they're a lot alike, particularly to all of us now as adults. You know, they're, they're cute. They take a lot of work. But they're not the same thing. And as much as you may dress your puppy like a child, it's not a child. And a content strategist is not a UX designer. It's not the same thing. It's similar. There are a lot of similarities out there. And so to kick us off today, I'm going to go through a couple of definitions just to get us all on the same page. For one thing, there are a lot of different definitions of just what user experience is. I define user experience as a process. It is the process of creating, be it a product, a service, an application, but it is the process of creating something that is usable and valuable. It's a process that can include things like user research, user interaction design, all of these different pieces. Now, it's also not quite the same thing, user experience is not quite the same thing as UI design, though they do get used in the same context quite a bit. And one thing that one thing that makes UX so interesting is that that process can take as long or as short as you want it to. You could consider the user experience starting with the moment that somebody lands on your website and ending with the moment that they finish purchasing the product. Or you could work to create an excellent user experience that starts with the moment that the user first heard of your company existing and ends the day that either they die or your company closes, right? We can create user experiences that are incredibly long or incredibly short. Think of a micro interaction. That's a user experience in and of itself. Some people spend their whole time just designing that experience. Now, let me explain UI design, because a lot of people use those interchangeably. And as a content strategist, words are important to me. UI design, well, first of all, a user interface exists whether or not you do any user experience. A user interface exists anywhere that there is literally a screen, an interface. It could be as terrible and ugly as the very first UIs were, 
or it could be as well thought out and carefully created as some of today's modern interfaces are. But the user interface exists either way. And the user interface design is literally the design of, the creation of that interface. It could be done very badly. Generally speaking, when it's done well, it's done while keeping the user experience in mind. And to that end, we end up using them interchangeably. We don't bother saying, so uh, I'm looking to hire a UI designer who considers the user experience. No, we just say I want a good UI designer. Of course they're gonna consider the user experience. That's their job, right? These days, it's almost, they, they go hand in hand. We just assume, we say, anybody who's doing their job well should be considering the user experience. We're all UX designers to that extent. Now, similarly to UX, content strategy is a process. You can create a content strategy that will consider only the experience on the site. You can create a content strategy that will put in guidelines from the moment that they touch the brand to the moment that they die or your company closes. Content is everywhere. You can have content without having a content strategy. You can have content that's just floating. My goal as a content strategist is to make sure that every touch point across that user experience is a good one. That every touch point considers the right content for the right person at the right moment, in the right places. And I would say that content strategy is to UX design as content management is to UI design. Content management is the work that we do to say, okay, well this is when the content should be edited. This is when the content should be produced. This is when it should be retired. And content management, like UI design, can be done without considering the general strategy. It's not gonna be very good if it's done that way. It's gonna be the equivalent of a UI based off no user experience whatsoever. But it can be done, it can exist. And there are plenty of content managers out there who actually are doing an excellent job and have never heard of content strategy, just happens to come naturally to them. Unfortunately, it seems to be that if we're all just waiting to happen, to luck out and find the right thing, uh, nobody's gonna put their, bet their money on that. So if you wanna be able to provide your company with a promise to say that we will get a return on this investment, you probably want to back that up with some metrics, you know, create an actual strategy, put together some guidelines that are based off something, rather than saying, ah, oh, we'll, just, we'll just throw some content management at the wall, we'll see, we'll pull things out when it feels right, we'll edit them if we feel like it today, and maybe we'll hit gold, right? It could happen. So the content management, when it's built on a solid content strategy, is really excellent, and in the same way the UI design, when built on the user experience, can give you something awesome. What I've described here, you may be noticing, is two very parallel roads. We've got content strategy working towards content management, we've got UX design working towards a good UI design. These are not intersecting. So where does this intersection come in? Are they just in totally different spaces? They can be. And as I said at the start of this talk, many of you working in UX might have been working to this point without a content strategist. And you're probably doing just fine. Nobody looks at a kid without a dog and says, well, they're not a real child. No, you're still a UX designer. You can still wake up every morning and go to work and put out some very quality work. But today, I'm gonna tell you six stories. Everybody likes stories. Today, I'm gonna tell you six stories about situations that I've been in where as a content strategist, I was able to make the UX designer's job just a little bit easier and make that project just a little bit better. Now, today we have a special treat. I'm not gonna tell you who, but somebody in this room was on a project that features in one of my stories today. Now, all of my stories have been anonymized, so I'll just leave you all to wonder and think, did I work with Marley on a project? Does this sound familiar? So have fun with that. So, six stories since six interaction, intersections, rather. The first one is about branding. I worked with a company that had 
a fantastic sort of brand. They had never really spent much time thinking about who they were, but they'd been working with the same types of clients for a long time, and they saw some patterns there, and they said, well, they seem to like us, so we'd like to put together a website that reflects that and can do even better than that. So they called in their visual designers, and they said, they said to their creative director, take this project, run with it, act as you would with any other project, and show us what you've got. And their designers went off and they created a couple of options. And they brought them in for review and they said, well, we could go in two directions. Here's option A and option B. And the stakeholders looked at it and they said, wow, this is great. I really love option A. And stakeholder two said, no, 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 I really like F option B. And they discussed it and they went round and round and they said, well, we think we like option A better, but could you show us a few variations off of that? So the designers went back and they worked really hard and they put all of their, their, they huffed and they puffed and they blew the design up and they said, all right, here's three variations on option A. And the stakeholders said, no, I think we like the other one. Well, I don't know, what do you think? See, I, I love that green though. Could we get more of that green in there? And the visual designer said, I do not know what to do. And said, you know what, we've got this content strategist here. Let me see what she thinks. And pulled me aside and said, why can't, you know, I work with clients all the time. We always have an easy time getting them to figure out what they should be deciding on. Why can't our own stakeholders figure out what they want? And I said, well, what's the messaging? I mean, I'm not gonna say what a designer should do, but if I were working on this project as a content strategist, my first question would be, what's the message behind each of these designs? And they said, yep. We don't have one of those. So we went back a step. We had meetings with the stakeholders. We interviewed them about what their goals were and why they felt that their clients really liked them. We went to the clients and we talked with them about what they were looking for and why they were coming to this business. And then out of that, I created two different messaging systems. I gave them both to the visual designer the visual design team took those and created two options, two designs, two site designs, each based off a different message. And they went to that meeting, and instead of saying, which do you like better, they were able to say, which of these reflects your goals better? And all of a sudden, instead of the stakeholders feeling like, how is it that we're always able to tell our clients what they should be able to do? But when turning the spotlight on ourselves, we don't know what we like, Instead, they were able to say, no, no, no. What is our goal? What is our message? And are we representing that message in the right way? Story number two, user journeys. Designers love user journeys. I've noticed this. I love, I love watching how designers will kind of think through that process of I've got all these screens and I want the user to go through these interactions in this way, and this is how they're gonna get where they're going, and this is where the journey starts, and this is where it ends. I mean, it's a story, and being a content strategist, I love stories. But sometimes they get really complicated really fast. So ages ago, I worked at an agency, and, uh, and I worked alongside a lot of designers. We weren't always on the same projects, and a friend of mine, who was one of the designers on the company, had been asked to put together a very complex system for a company that needed a scheduling system that eight different departments would be using, but only two of the departments would have the ability to edit. But three of the departments had to be able to see everything on it, and one of the departments had to be only able to see what their individual users could do on it. Different functionality all along the way. Oh, and by the way, the scheduling system was specifically for events that had to go through at least four different levels of approval before ending up on the calendar. And their calendar wasn't integrated with their email system. We can do that, right? So my poor designer friend is sitting there saying, all right, start with user number one, department number one. How are they gonna use this system? 
I've got 15 different pieces of functionality, and every way I look at it, the screen just gets so cluttered. So then I tried putting it all, each item on a different screen, and that ended up just being a mess. It's too many steps, too many clicks. I'm going back and forth. I need somebody to bounce ideas off. Enter the content strategist. So we took a look at it. And honestly, I think that there are many situations where I would have been struggling with the user journey and I would go to a designer and say, hey, can you help me sketch this out? I need your visual skills. And it's great. I love working with designers where we can have this back and forth because he was able to say, you know, I approach this visually. What are your thoughts? You look at things differently. And I said, well, I approach it by looking at the tasks because, because those you can kind of verbalize. And I, don't, I can't draw things, so I use sticky notes. So we took sticky notes and we wrote out each thing step by step that we wanted the user to do. And we put it down and then instead of trying to start from that square, you know, that what can we see on that responsive, what can we see on mobile or that tablet, what can we see on, on this size screen and how many things can you fit on it? Instead we were able to group the sections of the journey and say which of these interactions work together? Which ones need to be on the same screen? It's just a different way of thinking about it. And we were able to move that from the step-by-step -step on a screen to step-by-step -step in a verbal sense. And just that move from visual to verbal helped us open up so many more doors. Which brings me, speaking of complicated, to story number three. Story number three is in the world of higher education. Do any of you work with higher ed? Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My design team on higher education had a monster of a project before them. And while I had been hired to write a how-to guide they had been hired to design a site for a university that was partnered with some colleges and owned other colleges and would likely partner with more before the project was over. And they had to figure out a way to make this site usable by all. I don't know how they did it, honestly. My esteem for them and my pride at being able to be part of that team, I can't even, I, Kudos to all of you who work in, with this kind of thing every day. But the great thing about working on how to is it makes you dig through all of those little details and all of those pieces that when you're designing templates, you might not see because you're looking at the bigger picture. But as a content strategist, we have to dig into some of those details. And when it comes to higher ed sites that have so many details, the big picture piece is the site map. And the detailed piece is how many levels deep are we going? And how can these, how, how can this IA mirror other areas of the IA? How can it be set up in a way that's usable? How can it be set up in a way that anybody coming to this site is gonna be able to find the pieces they need easily without digging and digging and digging and digging? But at the same time, how can we show the connections between all of these different colleges? And this is an area where, again, I want to you know, reiterate about a thousand times that this is one of those areas that designers frequently do by themselves. There are very rarely information architects working on a team. And so IA sort of falls into somebody else's lap, and it's often the designers. And as far as I can tell, Designers seem to have an innate ability, maybe it is just that visual mentality, at being able to create excellent site maps and excellent senses of what the architecture should be. But I will say, it can make your life a lot easier to have a content perspective. Because for me, the content strategy is gonna be about grouping what types of content go together. And instead of trying to figure out how is it all going to match up nicely? We can start from just a, we don't know if it's gonna match up nicely. Let's figure out where people are trying to get to from what other pages. And what options do we have? Are we gonna call out in sidebars, for example, or are we going to use um, 
cross area links. You know, we had the situation that I'm sure many of you in higher ed and probably even outside of higher ed deal with frequently where we had a client saying, oh, can we just have that live here and also live over here? And we'll also have it in that drop down, right? That's okay. No, you can't have that live in three places. I mean, it might look fine from a design perspective, but that's the whole point of setting up an architecture, setting up a stable foundation, setting up a hierarchy so that it is in the same place every time, so that it lives in one spot. Not the content lives in one spot. I'm not gonna get into a whole piece on intelligent content, which is, we'll save for another day. But that the page itself lives in that spot. All right. Moving away from sitemaps and on to pair programming. Specifically, wireframes. Wireframes are the designer's, the designer's wheelhouse. Um, they're a great way to look at how functionality can come together. And as a content strategist, this is often where I figure out what messaging is going to be reflected on which pages. Um, or these days, what messaging is going to be reflected in which content blocks or in which responsive elements or all the different ways that we could look at a design. And I was lucky enough to work on one site where the first site where I ever was really introduced to an agile process, uh, where I had designers who said, okay, we were told to work with you and to do content strategy and design at the same time, but which comes first? Are you gonna give me the content first or do you need me to give you the design first? And I said, well, let's try both, which is a kind of confusing answer. Which brings me to pair programming. Now, in Agile methodology, which was developed for developers by developers, uh, pair programming is when two developers sit down at a computer together and one of them is actually doing the, the work, the typing, while the other looks over their shoulder and offers input. And whenever they get to something that's particularly complicated or particularly naughty, they can talk it out and work through it together. And frequently, it means the work goes a little faster, the problems get worked out more easily. For a designer and a content strategist, this is an awesome way to figure out which comes first, content or design. We picked a page that it was a particularly complex one that we said, well, I have no idea how my messaging is going to fit into your wireframe and you have no idea how you're going to create a wireframe that would work for my messaging. So we're both going to do it. So I sat down and worked through the messaging for the page and roughly figured out, I said, I've got a main message that I want to go somewhere front and center. I've got three smaller messages that need to go somewhere. And then I want to, I want a call to action that's going to bring us back to this other part. And meanwhile, the designer sat down and wireframed out the page. Then we swapped. And I said, oh, OK, well, if this was the design I was presented with, um, I didn't even think of that. This message could go right over there. Whereas my designer was saying, oh, how interesting. Well, if we have three main messages here instead of just two, you know, just two I would design it this way. And then we were able to compare the t our notes and identify things that neither of us would have thought of on our own, elements that we actually want to take from each of them. And in some situations, we said, wow, looking at that, we want to scrap both ideas. We want to take just a totally new idea that we're both sort of talking through as we've looked at what the other would do with our work. I highly recommend it if you have not done it. Um, as, as interesting as it is to experience once, now that I've started working on projects where we can do that during the concept design of every view, every journey, it's, it creates such a higher quality of end product. Story number five, content templates. Has anybody here worked with content templates before? couple of people. Content templates are the bane of many designers' experience, many designers' lives. Uh, when you're working with a content management system, which you frequently do when you're working with large amounts of content, you have to figure out what types of pages do we have. 
obviously, nobody wants an experience that is completely random and has a completely different look or a completely different page type everywhere that they go. So we look for a way to create some consistency. We say, for example, every article that goes on the blog is going to have a title and then an author name and then an image and then three paragraphs of, content, of, of copy and then two more images and then a by, byline. Something along those lines. We say, you know, every product page that we have is going to have a sidebar and it's going to have a main content area and then it's going to have three related items at the bottom, right? Those are templates. When you're working with a CMS, when you've got content strategists and designers working together, you'll frequently end up in a situation where you have tons and tons and tons of content and five or six templates. And then, in theory, you will be able to take all of that content and meld it into nice areas where it can work in the templates. So I worked on a project with roughly 30,000 pages. And they were hoping to use seven templates. And across those seven templates, all 30,000 pages were going to fit. And their designers, our designers, had done an amazing job. They had done some research. They'd picked out one example of each type of content. And they'd created templates that worked with it. And they'd gotten approval from stakeholders. And they'd created templates that would allow us to sub in different content types in different areas and given us lots of flexibility. It was great. And then we handed it off to the client. And the client looked at it and said, well, how do we get all of our pages into this, though? And we said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what? A year and a half after we started working on this, and now we're not sure if we're going to use them? And they said, yeah, we don't know if we can use it. Well, because our, our pages don't look like this right now, so how can we make them look like this? And we said, that's what content strategy is for. So we held a workshop. We sat down with them. We said, um, grab 10 pages that you're particularly worried about with this. Because certainly, there were some pages as they started to go through the site where they said, oh, yeah, this does have all the elements that we said we would have on that template. All right, I'm not worried about th that one. Now, this page has roughly the equivalent of a book of text and no images. So how is this going to work with your thing with one image and only three paragraphs of copy and then three related items? We don't have eight related items. It's all just one page. And we said, well, let's work through it together. And so being able to have a strategist in there where I come in knowing some best practices in terms of how much copy to put on a page, what it's going to look like when we go from tablet to mobile, what kind of experience we're going to have, um, thinking about what are the touch points, why is a person coming to this site, and are they coming to this site from their phone, are they coming to their site from their computer, and are they really going to be exploring the related content? Why did we put related content items at the bottom of that page? Why did we include these elements in this sidebar? I've got all that in my head. I've got those basic best practices. And so to be able to come into that workshop and sit down with them as they say, well, what do I do? I've, I've got, you know, we've got a lot of clients, and I'm sure you've worked with similar. We've got a very black and white image of this is what the page of content looked like today, and now you're showing me something new, and I can't just copy and paste it. And so we use content templates to be able to block out, all right, what on that long page of copy would you consider to be the main message? Or what, in that long block of copy, would you consider to be subsections? And then we can break that out together and set them up and get them into the habit of thinking that way. And last, and maybe least, because it's micro, um, micro interactions. If you're not familiar with micro interactions, I highly recommend Dan Saffer's book, Micro interactions. Uh, in it, he talks about a lot of examples of what he refers to as um, one, no, nope, I'm not going to get this right, so I'm not going to quote him on this, but essentially pieces of functionality that do only one thing. For example, the walk button at the street, at, when you're crossing the street. It doesn't, doesn't turn a light on for you, it doesn't 
alert you to how many minutes you have. It doesn't start your coffee maker so that when you get home there's fresh coffee. It does one thing. You press it, it sends a signal, the walk light comes up at some point later on. Micro interaction. Now, one subset of micro interactions is micro copy. For example, that little piece of help text underneath a text box. That subset of information that does, it only tells you one thing. It tells you what to do in this exact instance. And a lot of times, designers kind of get stuck putting that stuff in themselves, right? I mean, it's like three lines of text. We all know how to talk. We all learned how to write when we were six. So clearly, anybody can write three lines of text. And I've worked on projects where microcopy actually took up the bulk of the content strategy work. And in those situations, I had designers saying, well, why do we even need a content strategist for this? But what we found was happening was we had this whole project that the designers had put lots of time and effort into. And they had worked on their micro interactions. They had made sure that every, even the smallest interaction was a great experience. And yet, we had copy that didn't match from page to page. We had copy that was intended to tell users to do the same thing, but said one thing on one page and a slightly different thing on the other page, and it causes confusion. Not that we've ever got a user who says, wait a second, there you told me, click the button, and here you're telling me to press the button, and there you said tap. No, I mean, maybe somebody is, and they probably also edit Wikipedia in their spare time, but, but they're probably not doing that. What's actually happening, though, is you've just got somebody who by page three is like, wait, what does this mean? Whereas if you had a consistent bit and probably A-B tested or, or at least thought through and put some best practices into that microcopy, then they would be having a much better experience. And it seems like such a silly thing to me to spend so much time on really perfecting your micro interactions and yet laying microcopy just fall to the wayside like that. So that is my sixth story. That is my last way that a content strategist can hopefully make your life better. But we're not quite done yet. Because there's always somebody out there thinking, all right, I want a content strategist to make my life better, but do I really have to talk to them? No. But we'd like it if you did. And it's really not that hard. Here are a couple of opportunities that I've come up with that may help you to get started on this collaboration. Number one, swap skill sets. I cannot tell you how little I understood about how hard your work was, designer's work was, until the day I tried to sketch out my own ideas. Wow, I am a terrible designer. I, I don't know how to stress that enough. I can. I can't use Photoshop at all or Illustrator or any of the tools that you use. I can barely use a pencil. And I have found that swapping with a designer and having them try their hand at putting together content guidelines makes them start to appreciate what I can do as well. So I highly recommend it. Number two, play Pictionary. You know, you may not have played since high school. You may not have played since elementary school. You probably don't remember just how much fun it is, but you also probably don't remember how many skills you're using now that are built off the ability to draw what somebody else is telling you to draw as they're describing their idea for, for you. And getting a group of content strategists and UX designers together to play Pictionary and just have that experience of practicing hearing someone else's ideas and getting them down on paper, huge. Bring it to your next holiday party or your next, I don't know, casual Friday at work or just bring it in for a morning meeting. And on the flip side of that, try your hand at dictating sketches too. Because for a designer, to some extent, you have the experience of trying to create something visually that somebody else has told you about. But have you tried 
how hard would it be for you to try and get your idea across to somebody else who is designing? I also recommend game storming. If you've ever heard me speak before, you know I basically can't get through a talk without talking about game storming. But it's mostly because it's awesome. Uh, essentially, three designers got together years and years ago now, not that long ago, and started thinking about all of the problems that come up when you try to get a group of adults to brainstorm. And the problems of, you know, one person just speaks louder than everybody else, or somebody's cowed by their boss being in the room, or all of these things where you don't really get brainstorming going, or you leave the room with all these ideas, but there's no clear goal, or nobody really came to a decision on something, or it was just a waste of a meeting. And so they said, maybe the problem is we don't need brainstorming. We need game storming. We need games have very clear rules, and they're intended to be fair, and there is an end objective. So they came up with a series of activities, and a lot of them you've probably used in one way or another before, because they weren't, they weren't reinventing the wheel. They said, what are the things we've done before that worked? And now there's a book, there's a website, you can add your own, gogamestorm.com, fantastic site. Uh, Game Storming the Book by Dave Gray, Sonny Brown, and can you say that louder? James McAnufo, thank you. I owe him an apology, I always forget his name. Um, and try them out, they're fantastic. And lastly, this one has a bit of a story. I have a friend who was fighting with her husband and was explaining to me that the problem is everybody tells them that they really need to learn to compromise. But compromising sucks, because basically when you compromise, nobody gets what they want. And I said, all right, I have to find a way to prove that wrong, because I'm a little bit competitive, and I just don't like that idea. I don't want that to be what a compromise is. And so, this is my question to all of you. Can you all please help me to prove her wrong by looking for ways that we can compromise without creating something that nobody wants? Because I believe that there are compromises out there and I make it a point to try and find them where we're able to find the middle point in that Venn diagram between what I want and what you want. That there is a middle point in that Venn diagram. That they're not two totally separate areas. Because really we all have the same end goal. I'm going to bring this full circle to where we started. User experience designers and content strategists are both trying to make sure that we create a positive, delightful experience, something that is making our end user very happy, something that will make them want to come back over and over and over again and ensure that this experience does not end until the day they die because our company won't go out of business first. We all want the same thing. And our work together is mutually beneficial. And so this is my call to all of you. When you leave this room, go with me to find the ways that we can collaborate, that we can compromise, and that we can make that a good thing. Thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes left for questions. No, no, I just wanted to uh, hear what your background was and, and sort of how you came to where you are today. Theater. Um, Here. I, uh, actually, yeah, long ago, theater. And then I um, worked as a project manager, and I started project managing in a game company, and then moved into software, and from there into user experience. And while working as a user experience consultant, I first heard the term content strategy and said, hey, I've always been that person who did UX during the day and writing at night. Maybe I could just do writing during the day. And now it turns out content strategy isn't really all about writing, but I love it anyhow. I've actually found that by um, working side by side with a content marketer, that's the magic for both uh, the product that ends up coming from your work. But as far as like software and other products go, designers are typically invited into that conversation and a part of that conversation, but content isn't. Content tends to be more focused on brand. So I kind of want to know your opinion on where you think content belongs in the product as well. It's a great question. Uh, to me, that's a lot of the time where that idea of micro-interactions come into play. 
Um, ideally, content strategy is about creating the guidelines, the process, and the plan for all content that will be created, and that includes voice and tone guidelines. It's far beyond brand. It can be very specific to a product. Um, so to some extent, it ends up being in in-house companies. A lot of times, content strategists end up working either with content marketers or, or the company decides they don't need strategists at all. They just need content marketers uh, to further their brand. To my mind, content strategists do very much need to play a role in the software aspect because, because there is content being created and we are creating touch points, particularly now that we've got you know, the internet of things and, and we have so much cross device collaboration. So now your software product might be sending an email that is then targeting a social media interaction and all of those are going to have slightly different voices and all of them are going to have um, different lengths of time that the con before the content needs to be retired or edited and so we've got you know, curation and management and governance aspects that need to be worked into place. So keep fighting the good fight. Yes. You are so lucky. You have so many people who all want to do this. That's great. Um, it is tough. Uh, to some extent, that ends up being a workflow issue. And it's an organizational piece that needs to be worked out. Uh, is there either there needs to be one person who is given the, the responsibility of maintaining the messaging across all of those pieces? Um, I'm a content strategist, so to my mind, that should be a content strategist. But far be it for me to say what's right for your specific organization without actually knowing the people involved. Um, but yes, ideally, there should be probably not any one of the writers, but someone who is given responsibility to maintain messaging across all fields. And, um, and also, probably some thought should be given to how all those writers are working with the rest of the team and, uh, and how you can make that a smoother, smoother transition. Well, thank you all so much for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a great day.